As Baba Diyam said, in the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we are taught. If we do not know something, how can we love it? How do we get to know something as intangible as nature? By spending time in it? By watching it? Connecting with it? Collecting observations to help us understand it? I would argue yes, for how can one hope to know something without observing it to understand it? And how do we love the unknown? To know something is to have an understanding of it. To know something opens the door to appreciation, respect, and perhaps even love. If we love something, we will naturally want to take care of it, nurture it and conserve it. Even just simple understanding or perhaps the more esteemed respect can bring about a desire for general conservation and caretaking. This is why conservationists consistently try to educate you about nature. And it is helpful, and it is important. But to want to nurture something, to actively self-sacrifice for it, demands a deeper connection of love. Think of a mother's love and devotion to nurture her baby, literally giving of herself for her child. That fierce, wild love that pushes you every day to improve. This, I argue, is needed too. We need people willing to love nature, to sacrifice for it, to be willing to educate themselves and stand up to those needing it. Why else would some bright souls force themselves to work tirelessly at the thankless task of conservation? Why go through 10 years of college to work long hours for comparatively little pay? Why walk when you can drive? Why give up unsustainable foods that you love eating? Because you love something more, and I think it's our job to make nature that something more. How can we do this? How can we facilitate such love for our natural world? I believe nature is pretty darn good at captivating our minds and winning our hearts. We just need to bring people to nature and get out of the way. When I take students out in nature, like on a mangrove walk, I try to build in plenty of time for quiet communing with nature, for postcard perfect scenes to be filed away in their minds and hopefully pulled out later and reflected on, and maybe even appreciated. Luckily, Samoa abounds with stunning scenery and bountiful resources. We are blessed with healthy forests, fascinating geology, and wonderful coral reefs very near our shores. Our islands are a perfect natural lab. I feel honored to get to teach students and residents in American Samoa about the ocean. Getting to help people understand and appreciate our underwater resources is a joy. There's nothing better than seeing a student's huge smile after their first reef snorkel. To be part of that moment feels amazing. Even better is knowing I have just opened the door to understanding, appreciating, and maybe even loving nature. And we need this understanding, appreciation, love, and respect to face the increasing pressures of climate change in a united manner. Climate change can feel overwhelming, even impossible. I believe American Samoa is uniquely situated to tackle the impossible, and I hope to convince you of that tonight. Here in American Samoa, we are blessed with one of only four NOAA observatories in the whole world. Our air is considered to be the cleanest in the world. Nonetheless, we face the same greenhouse gas buildup that plagues the rest of our Earth. As you can see from our very own local Keeling curve, our air has increased from 330 parts per million in 1975 to over 400 today. Science tells us the safe level for a stable planet is 350. I think we all understand that this buildup of greenhouse gases is causing our planet to trap more heat and warm up. Not only has our average temperature increased, but we now see more extreme heat days. These periods of extreme heat are not only uncomfortable for us, but cause our plants and animals to suffer as well. And not just on land, our oceans absorb an enormous amount of heat and are warming as well. Here you can see that worldwide our oceans are now regularly warmer than normal by one degree Fahrenheit. This is an incredible increase when you think about the volume of water in our oceans. For us in the Pacific Islands, our oceans are regularly seeing over one and a half degree increases above normal. And local temperature increases near land can be much more dramatic. These are averages across open ocean. One of the most iconic ecosystems of the tropical islands is now at risk, our coral reefs. 
This image was taken before and during a 2015 bleaching event at our popular beach in Fatima Futi. And this image was used in news articles around the world. Coral bleaching occurs when the water is too warm. The coral isn't dead, but it won't recover unless the water cools down within a few weeks. And here's the worst part. When the coral bleaches, it usually doesn't grow or reproduce that year. This means our reefs aren't able to regrow and keep up with the normal wear and tear of daily life, which means we will soon lose our best defense against shoreline erosion. Our reefs break the pounding waves all day, every day. Without them, our shorelines will erode even faster. Here's another image of a colleague surveying some branching coral in our airport pools. These pools were blasted out in the 1940s to build our island's only runway and purposefully left to help protect the airport by breaking the waves. As coral bleaches more and more frequently, we will lose this critical protection. Another serious impact of our loss of reef health is our loss of our fish habitat. Reef fish are a really critical source of local, fresh, healthy protein in the islands, and this is seriously threatened by coral bleaching. One of the most pressing climate change impacts for us in the islands is sea level rise. Sea level rise is, of course, caused by a warming climate, both due to ice melt, adding water to our oceans, and because water expands when it warms. Globally, the average rate of sea level rise is about an eighth of an inch per year, or 3.2 millimeters. Unfortunately for us here in American Samoa, our islands are also sinking. We only learned earlier this year that our main island of Tutuila has been subsiding or sinking at a rate of 0.63 inches per year since the 2009 earthquake that generated a devastating tsunami. In the past decade, we have more than half a foot. Our current relative rate of sea level rise which combines both the sea level rise and subsidence, is 0.76 inches per year, meaning we have seen a loss of over seven inches in the past decade. This is almost as much as the previous 100 years of sea level rise alone. This is truly unprecedented. If this rate continues by 2060, we will have seen a sea level rise increase of 38.6 inches, or 3.2 feet. The tools available to us to conceptualize sea level rise do not yet account for our island's rate of subsidence, but using this new information, we can project into the future to estimate when we might see these impacts. Here we're seeing the island's only runway of our airport, the Lagoon Anuli village called the Pala Lagoon, and the peninsula of land where I happen to live called Coconut Point. This imagery and elevation data were collected in 2011. So if we use our current relative sea level rise rate, we can expect to see one foot of sea level rise since 2009 by 2024 in just five years. The light blue shaded areas will be underwater at average high tide, meaning storm surge or unusually high tides would be even higher. Keeping that same rate of sea level rise increase, which we expect to continue speeding up into the future, we expect to see two feet of sea level rise by 2040 you can see the impacts are growing and are up to the island's only main road by this point, meaning at times of high waves or extra high tides, the road may be impassable. At three feet of sea level rise in 2056 or before, we have lost part of our main runway, meaning our airport may only be usable at low tide. At four feet in 2071, the island's only runway is now underwater at average high tide and the main road is flooded. Another major concern that faces tropical islanders are cyclones, or hurricanes for those in the northern hemisphere. Cyclones feed off of heat energy in the ocean, which explains why we see more superstorms now than ever before. Stronger storms plus higher sea level rise means more risk of flooding, as we have seen across the world. In January of 2016, American Samoa was luckily missed by Cyclone Victor, which passed over 300 miles east of Tutuila as a Category 1. Nonetheless, the damage to eastern facing shorelines was still significant. This image shows a newly constructed seawall along the main road of Tutuila in Nuuli village being overwashed by storm waves. This seawall was constructed before we realized our islands are sinking. Such storms cause intense shoreline erosion, which greatly increase our risk of shoreline loss. I took this photo in front of my house. We lost about two feet of shoreline, and my neighbor's son is standing on our road checking out the pieces that have fallen away. And you can see other pieces in the water. Another image from the damage in front of my house shows the loss of man-made structures, like this one, that are supposed to protect our shoreline. 
We expect to see more strong cyclones threatening our islands in the coming years, and we will need our residents to be prepared. Currently, only a few villages in American Samoa have climate resiliency plans, and this is something we hope to see grow. I always encourage my students to get involved in these important planning processes, whether it's through an official internship or just by talking with their family. Speaking of students, I am beyond proud to call a number of my past marine science students from here in American Samoa Community College my colleagues today. Here are a few examples of our alumni who are contributing to our island's resiliency. In the top left shows a past marine science student of mine who graduated from here, earned her bachelor's in Hawaii on a full ride scholarship and returned home. She is now working as our first Samoan territorial watershed coordinator. Top right image shows another alumni of mine who graduated and was selected as the first Kupu intern for the National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa. She is now employed by the sanctuary as their assistant education coordinator, and she's using her stipend from her Kupu internship to earn her bachelor's in coastal management. Bottom left shows an image of an alumni from our reef surveying techniques program who joined us when she was already working for our coral reef advisory group. This young lady took what she learned in our course and applied it. She earned herself a spot on a NOAA research cruise where she impressed everyone. She is now our first Samoan NOAA Coral Reef Fellow. The lower middle image shows a student of mine who graduated from here, earned her bachelor's in Hawaii, returned home, also on his full ride scholarship. She now works for our National Park of American Samoa with their marine team surveying reefs. Bottom right image shows two past alumni of our program who earned their associates here, their bachelors from off island in Hawaii, came home, and now the fellow on the left is our territorial fisheries biologist, and the gal on the right conducts coral reef surveys for our island. Like most of my students, many of these alumni started out when I met them not knowing how to swim. One of my students said in a reflection paper from her first reef snorkel after we taught her how to swim, that <laughs> seeing the beautiful, brightly colored fish swimming around looked like jewels on the reef and swam through her mind like candies. Despite growing up on the island, many of our youth don't get to immerse themselves in our underwater wonderland, so is it any surprise that they don't love our reefs if they never knew them? Yet look at them now after spending time in our oceans. They are champions of our marine life, each and every one of them. And did you know that American Samoa is where coral reef science began? According to Professor Emeritus Dr. Charles Birkeland, most people consider the beginning of coral reef science to be an expedition to the Great Barrier Reef in Australia in 1928. But actually, a whole decade before, a lot was going on right here in Tutuila. Alfred Mayer and others studied the coral reefs here, and they conducted a coral reef survey transect in the village of Aua, which is now world famous amongst us coral nerds. Um, as being the oldest continuously surveyed transect in the world for over a hundred years. Can you imagine getting to study coral reefs in the cradle of coral reef science? Another bright spot for American Samoa is our territory's commitment to becoming 100% renewable by 2050. This is a very aggressive goal compared to most of the U.S. and is something we should be proud of. It also means an increase in excellent well-paid jobs in our new green economy for our youth. Yet another unique aspect in Samoa that lends itself well to cultivating excellent resource managers is the strong tradition of passing on oral, oral histories through generations. This provides our youth with a strong sense of place. They grew up hearing about great grandpa's fishing trips and they know that today to catch that same amount of fish to the same reef takes four times or more as long. Having a strong sense of place with a long historical perspective is an important tool to fight the issue of shifting baselines or how resource perception changes over time. Finally, it is well known that Samoan islands were referred to by explorers as the navigator islands, owing to Samoan's impressive ability to wayfind or navigate using nature. I believe this also positions us well to navigate coming challenges from climate change. And I hope this proud history helps inspire our youth to continue to look to nature for wisdom. Although many young Samoans may not realize it, they are living in one of the healthiest tropical ecosystems left in our rapidly changing planet. This makes it easy to appreciate and love nature, but finding the right approach to inspire our youth to work hard for the betterment of their island and our world can be tough, but it's very worthy work. 
I commend each and every one of you who are here tonight who have taken time away from your family and lives to attend this event with an open mind. And I would like to end with a piece I wrote to cultivate motivation that I like to call Inspire the Uninspired. They say it's impossible. It just can't be done. They say, you'll see when you're older, you're just too young. They say, grow up and face the facts before your song is sung. And yet, and yet they say the youth are our future and place all the world's hopes, dreams, and troubles on your shoulders, expecting the impossible while saying it's impossible. And that, that is the crux of it. To achieve the impossible, you must break down those barriers between the possible and the impossible. You must believe you are the future indeed. And did you know when Kennedy declared we would put a man on the moon in 10 years, everyone said, it's impossible. And yet, and yet, eight years later, when Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon, a cheer went up around the world. And in the NASA control room, the cheers were the loudest, coming from those who dared, who dreamed they could do the impossible. And did you know what the average age was for their systems engineers? 26, meaning when Kennedy's call went out, they were 18. 18, young enough to believe, to be audacious enough to achieve the impossible. When civil rights marches filled the streets of the South, they were filled with youth, those believing, those who believed in basic human decency, who believed that when presented with right and wrong, we will choose right. So believe, my hearts, believe in the impossible, because after all, when you break it down, the word says, I am possible. Thank you.